It is a year of strife, social and political upheaval, and general economic misery. No, it is not the year 2023, but instead 1789, a year for a revolution. In this video, I tackle my greatest challenge yet, attempting to accurately pronounce French names. This is, of course, the French Revolution explained. Poorly. The French Revolution is a complex subject, to put it mildly, but I'm going to do my best here and you get what you pay for with this level of education. So let's jump in. The underlying causes stem mostly from the economic and social inequality present in the Kingdom of France as it entered the late 18th century. Radical leaps in medicine and technology caused a massive population spike throughout the century, and unfortunately food production failed to keep up. While wages across all industries rose over 20%, the prices and general cost of living rose over 65% within that same period. Huh, this is all sounding depressingly familiar. Many blame the current situation on the lack of decisive government action, and they weren't really wrong. As the gap between the nobility and peasantry widened further and further, France had basically entered a period where the aristocracy and richie riches were living it up in lavish palaces and eating cake, while the common folk and peasants were drudging it up in squalor and slow starvation, even more so than before. We introduce Louis XVI, King of France, as he decides to gather the various estates of the kingdom into a general assembly to discuss everyone's favorite topic, taxes. To be fair, there had been a severe lack of major tax reforms for many, many years, and the costs of aiding the American Revolution and the formal declaration of war against Britain in 1778 meant that the crown was spending much, much more than it could reasonably cover. The assembly, called the Estates General of 1789, convened in Versailles and was made of the major three estates of the realm, the clergy, the nobility, and the commoners. Needless to say, the discussion did not go well for Old Lou. What was anticipated by the crown and nobility to be a rather straightforward discussion of financial reforms turned into dangerous discussions of fundamental constitutional changes, something the ruling class wasn't exactly interested in entertaining, because, well, they were the ruling class. This assembly is identified by many to be the true beginning of the French Revolution. The second estate, the nobility, also ruled that only landowners could sit with their estate, which excluded the immensely popular Count Mirabeau. Although a member of the nobility and famed writer, orator, and prominent statesman, he had no say in the proceedings and was left out of the cool kids club. Abiseus, a priest, political theorist, and elected member of the commoner state, argued that the commoner state should take precedence over the other two, as more than 95% of the population fell or was represented within that estate. Through some impressive and shrewd political maneuverings, Abiseus was able to have some members of the clergy estate join forces with the commoner state, combining into a megazord estate, or as they actually called themselves, the National Assembly. Now, with the power to proceed without the nobles, the assembly proved a dangerous political power to the ruling class. King Louis knew that if the National Assembly met to reform the Constitution, it could be disastrous for himself and the nobility. So in an omega-brained maneuver, he literally just tried to stop them from meeting by closing the rooms where the estates normally gathered, claiming he needed them for reasons. So on June 20th, 1789, the assembly promptly met at a tennis court in Versailles, debating critical political reforms between sets, I would imagine. With support coming in from the clergy and even some noble estate members, and from the general public, the king was forced to back off from the assembly for now. A month later, on July 12th, as the National Assembly continues to meet and discuss constitutional reforms, rumors of the king using the Swiss Guard to forcibly disperse them reaches them. Large Crowds of protesters intent on protecting the assembly gather, and the French guards, commanded to keep the peace, either siding with the protesters or just generally fans of staying alive, refuse their orders to disperse the rapidly angering crowds. The guard actually joins the protesters, empowering them with a fully trained and outfitted soldier regiment. I'm not entirely sure when a crowd of protesters turns into an angry mob, but the French royalty soon found out, as the angry mass of men and women, now almost a thousand strong, storm the symbol of royal authority and tyranny in Paris, the massive fortress, prison, and armory of Bastille. The storming of Bastille is also considered by many the event that truly kicked off the revolution and is one of the most famous events in French history. Although it was manned by a garrison and with over two dozen cannons on the battlements, after a day of periodic shooting and fighting, the governor of the Bastille, one Bernard René Delany, attempted to negotiate the surrender of the fortress and evacuation of himself and his men. Despite the mob saying, nah, he finally opened the gates and surrendered as the garrison lacked food supplies and fresh water, only suffering a single casualty in the actual fighting during the day. The mob greeted Delany with open arms, and fists, and clubs, and eventually blades. Beaten and stabbed to death, he kind of lost his head, literally, as it was paraded around Paris on a pike. Shortly after, the Bastille was torn down and the king desperately attempted to restore order, namely by appointing the Marquis de Lafayette as commander of the National Guard, or commonly just called Lafayette, as his full name, Marie-Joseph Paul Yves Roch Gilbert de Mortier de Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette, didn't exactly roll off the tongue. 
Civil authority continued to fall apart as unrest grew within the kingdom. The aristocracy began to flee Paris as they were frequently attacked and faced just general animosity. On August 26, 1789, Mirabeau, now the most prominent member of the National Assembly, publishes the first Statement of Rights, called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, and the Assembly turns their focus to creating a shiny new French constitution. The constitution consisted of lots of complex political changes, but the basic premise seemed to be taking power from the monarchy and giving it to other legislative bodies and representatives representatives, as well as abolishing feudalism, turning France into more of a constitutional monarchy instead of just a good old-fashioned monarchy. Some of the changes, such as restricting political rights like voting to only those who they considered active citizens, disenfranchised many of the common folk and was pretty poorly received. The king and clergy were not particularly thrilled with the changes either, but lacking significant political and military power meant they just kinda had to go with the flow for now, as even the standing French armies experienced fractures and divisions. Social order continued to fall with the common folk still suffering from food shortages and anger at the National Assembly and their slow progress. It turns out it's hard to be patient for political reform when you're literally starving to death. The French Revolution heard you liked political divisions, so it put some divisions on its divisions and from fall 1789 to spring 1791, a nice complicated divided mess had sprouted from the revolution. As certain political groups opposed or supported the revolution and fractures within those groups, and within those groups thought the revolution too extreme or not extreme enough. Put simply, there was lots of yelling and screaming at each other, with the occasional beheading and various changes and reforms during this time. King Louis put in time out and house arrest and wanting to reassert his power, attempts to sneak away from the palace in disguise, and possibly seek refuge in Austria, where forces loyal to the crown resided. However, unfortunately for him, he rolled a natural one on his stealth check and is recognized and captured almost instantly. This severely hurts public opinion of the king, and fears of a new war with Austria or other neighboring countries begins to surface. Many revolutionaries who watched the American Revolution and said, so why do we need a king again, wanted to abolish the monarchy completely. However, others argued against these changes and King Louis was forced to swear an oath of allegiance to the new constitution. On July 17th, 1791, a massive crowd of protesters demanding the king be deposed. As the protests began to escalate and stones started being thrown, Lafayette ordered his guard to fire into the crowd, killing dozens of people. Unsurprisingly, this had a pretty negative impact to Lafayette's approval rating, with the public and tensions only worsened from there. We jump forward to April 20th, 1792. The newly elected Legislative Assembly, not quite content with just a revolution and some political upheaval, decides to declare war on both Austria and Prussia, who they believe harbor anti-revolutionary movements that would put an end to the reforming kingdom. That same month, the infamous guillotine sees its first use and becomes both a symbol and popular method of removal of certain disliked individuals by the revolutionaries. Freemason Joseph Ignacy Guillotine, while not the inventor of the guillotine, proposed the widespread use of the device for executions. As a physician, he saw it as a much more efficient and humane way to carry out the death penalty as opposed to the breaking wheel and other common, more grisly methods of execution. Just a few months after the declarations of war, a massive crowd of protesters stormed the two, uh, two years. Storm the Tuileries? Tuileries? What is it? Tuileries. Palace and capture the king and his wife Marie Antoinette, finally and completely ending the power of the monarchy. The Prussians, having had several victories over the French forces and skirmishes, push a hard offensive towards Paris itself. They are unfortunately for them greeted by a quickly moving wall of cannonballs, as the cannonade at Valmy completely decimates their forces. The French, high on victory and feeling confident that their new constitutional changes have real power, dissolve the legislative assembly and establish the National Convention, officially proclaiming themselves the French First Republic the very next day after the battle. And on January 17th, 1793, Louis, the last king of France, is sentenced to death by guillotine. His wife, Marie Antoinette, famously and inaccurately quoted as saying, let them eat cake, when told about the starving commoners, is also put to the teen nine months later. Following Louis' execution, things settle down and everyone lives peacefully ever after. Okay, not really. The multiple wars with the other European powers, fractures and divisions within the National Assembly, and the continued food shortages have a dramatic impact, and honestly, reading all of this, it's a miracle France survived as a nation following the revolution. June 1793, the Jacobins, a more radical group of revolutionaries, seize control of the National Convention and implement some extreme changes. They also attempted to completely end anti-revolutionary sympathies, and the French Revolution entered the appropriately named Reign of Terror, the most brutal period of the revolution. Revolution. 
The Reign of Terror turned from hunting and executing anti-revolutionaries into lots of grudge settling and personal vengeance. During the 10 months of the Reign of Terror, an estimated 17,000 people were tried and executed mostly by beheading, with thousands of others dying in prisons without trial. Maximilien Robespierre, leader of the feared Committee of Public Safety, personally ordered and oversaw many of the executions until his own execution by reactionary forces in July of 1794. Turns out something called the Reign of Terror isn't exactly popular with the public and eventually they revolted against the extreme measures taken. This is called the Thermidorian Reaction, marks a more moderate shift for French political power, even though many Jacobins were hunted down and killed in revenge for actions taken during the previous months. It was, to put it mildly, an unpleasant time. The French constitution continued to be reformed, and more changes were initiated, and I think some more important stuff happened, I don't know, this is getting a little confusing. Luckily there was a new player on the stage to clear things up for us. The infamous Napoleon Bonaparte. The young and successful general with popular support ended the remaining royalist and Jacobin protests using the French army and the French directory, a five-person committee appointed by parliament and in charge of governing the new republic was formed. The directory's four years in power marked the beginning of the end of the French Revolution, and was pretty much riddled with corruption, incompetence, and inefficiency, relying almost entirely on the French military to retain power. Unfortunately for them, they didn't really hold the reins of power for the military. That would be its commander, of course, Napoleon. He grew frustrated with the Directory's incompetence and corruption, and on November 9th, 1799, he staged a military coup, seizing control of the French government and appointing himself first consul and soon-to-be emperor of France. This event marked the end of the tumultuous French Revolution and beginning of the Napoleonic era. The aftermath of the revolution and its implications rippled across the world and shaped much of modern Europe today. Whew, that is a lot of stuff. Honestly, I probably should have split this up in like four videos because I covered maybe 10% of the actual events, but that's what you get for learning poorly. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, consider subscribing so you too can continue to receive a terrible education from an increasingly unreliable source, but thanks for watching.